everybody. Welcome. I uh, love the sound of voices because it means that we're loving each other's uh, company and presence. And I'm also thankful that as you were talking, you didn't see me stumble down the steps because you saw it. That was like a real Inspector Clouseau moment, wasn't it? <laughs> I meant to do that. Yes, of course I meant to do that. Well, good morning and welcome everyone to First Christian Church of Atlanta. It is, of course, Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of you. And also a special day. It's been hot, has it not? And it's going to be hot throughout this week. But that's actually not the reason we're wearing t-shirts. We're wearing t-shirts today because it's just a wonderful day of celebration. Of course, it is summertime. But after services today, we also have our food truck that has been brought in by Robert, the Burger 21 food truck. Speaking of Robert, did you know that today, is it today? Is it today? Today. Today is Robert's birthday and... Not a day over 21. And of course, uh, I think later this week, Bob Wallace has a birthday. Can we sing to Bob and Bob? It is also a great day to be here in worship. We have so many people to thank for so many good things. Uh, we want to move on to our first announcement today, which is, uh, ah, yes, great job. <laughs> Don't you like that pause? Huh? Great job, everybody. You like that shirt? Thank you. Great job to everybody who has come this morning. But I wanted to say to our deacon chair, uh, Jeannie Adamson, because I've noticed over the last three weeks, officially our deacon year doesn't start until next week. But have you noticed how we've had deacons who have served, taken out the offering, serving communion, watching the doors, locking the doors and everything? So already we have got the deacons on the job, and it's, it's wonderful. And the fact that we're kind of back into the swing of things with taking up the offering and serving the communion from the front, it's a nice feel. It's a nice feel to think that we are continuing to march forward, we're continuing to progress. And so thank you to Jeannie Adamson for getting that arranged and for keeping them. Uh, and by the way, how many new deacons do we have? A lot. I, can't even, I think we have a total of 14 or 15. So we're doing, it's a wonderful time to be here at First Christian Church of Atlanta. The next slide is of the congregational meeting that is today. So following worship, we uh, are going to have a brief congregational meeting. I think Jim Holiday is taking over, is that correct, as our uh, upcoming board chair. So just think Frank Sinatra, my way, and all that kind of stuff. And so we will have a brief one, and that will be to vote on the names that have been nominated for elders and deacons and all the various positions that are coming up starting next week. Next slide, please. Continue to advertise our summer tutoring program, math tutoring. Thanks again, as always, to Kirk for giving his time and, and talent to that. And uh, I don't know that anybody came today, but it's uh, only two out of about ten Sundays that we've not had people come for counseling. I mean, for math tutoring, some, about the same thing, more or less. And, uh, but it's, it's been a wonderful outreach of the church. So continue to support that. Next, we have had two weeks of the six-week Bible study on Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I think that has gone really well. And uh, if you have any curiosity about it, ask one of the people who've been coming to that. Anybody who care to, to raise their hand? And so, yeah, we've had about nine or ten people show up for that. It's been really interesting so far. It continues on. And then starting tomorrow morning at 9.30, the Adventures in Music and Art Camp kicks off. We have, I think, 11 students who are signed up. But even, even more important, we have a lot of our wonderful church people who are involved in that. Anne, do you have anything you want to say or announce? Okay. 
I know that we have a lot of work to do this week. It's going to be a very busy week, but I know it's going to be a blessing. Thank you to everyone who has volunteered to participate. And also, thank you to all, every one of you who have supported through prayer and through giving and so many other things. Is that We have one more slide, don't we? Oh, we didn't put it on there. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget we have lunch right after church today. So, uh, food truck will be here. And uh, I do recommend the buffalo chicken burger, but there are many other wonderful choices. I think there's a mushroom burger and so forth. Yeah, it's going to be great. So let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. And I'll turn it over to our worship leader, Mr. Elliot Denmark. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church of Atlanta. Welcome to all here in the sanctuary, as well as those of you who have joined us online. Our opening hymn is number 27, Come Thy Almighty King. Please stand as you are able. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning, guys. Happy Father's Day to the fathers. So, I want to talk today about waiting and faith and community, which don't seem like they're very connected, but they are. So, have either of you ever had to wait for something before? What's something you've waited for? Something that I have waited for was to go and make my lunch. Did you have to wait by yourself? Or did you have to wait with the microwave? I had to wait for my turn with the microwave because Tucker was making a pizza, which was only for him to take 45 seconds, but my meal would to take like over t a couple of minutes in the microwave. It was frustrating, right? Yeah. Yeah. How about you? similar to like waiting for the food to finish eating up. All right, well. So we have to wait for a lot of things as kids. And the good news is it's practice because we have to wait for a lot of things as adults too. So our Bible lesson today uh, includes waiting for the Holy Spirit. In the beginning of the Bible, they have to wait for the promised Messiah to come. Then he finally comes, and then he says he's leaving, but he says, don't worry, if you wait, I'll send the Holy Spirit to come. And then later in the, Old, or in the New Testament, we find out we also have to wait for Jesus himself to come back. So it's a whole lot of waiting. And so I think that's why in life we have to practice waiting. We wait for Christmas to come. We wait for the end of the school day to come. We wait for summer to start. But part of our reading today talks about you can wait with a community of believers who are all waiting for the same thing, which is sometimes hard to do if you don't know when it's going to happen or what's going to happen. 
So the Bible encourages us to come to church so that we can all wait for something that we don't necessarily understand. We don't have any proof that it's even going to happen in the first place. All we could do is apply our faith within a community of people with faith and wait. So good luck with waiting, and I hope your microwave cooks faster next time. <laughs> Amen. As we approach our time of congregational prayer, we are having a, a sort of an upbeat day, a very happy day, but I also want us to be experiencing, we all bear some of that scarring. We all feel like it is a part of who we are. It's a part of our nation. So if, with your permission, I thought today we would spend our time of congregational prayer focusing on healing from the violence that we are experiencing in our country today. This will not keep us from offering up words of praise and gratitude to our Lord, but let us also pray for our nation. Let us pray. And let us remember all who have been harmed by violence. We acknowledge the strength of those who have survived and those who are still struggling to heal. For their sake and for ours, we commit ourselves to building each other up and to healing together. Let us remember the families and loved ones of those who have died in violent crimes. We acknowledge their pain and their deep grief. They too are part of our community and need our love and help towards healing. Let us remember the perpetrators and the families of those who commit violent crimes. We acknowledge that their lives also are devastated and their hopes are dashed. For their sake and for ours, we remember that pain goes out in many directions from each act of violence. We will stand up to violence. We stand together expressing our unity, our connection to each other, and to God, our hope for healing and our hope for transformation. May the spirit of our creator move through us. Help us to transform and heal our communities. And let us begin by transforming ourselves so that we may go in peace and with hope. And now in this moment of gathered worship, O oh Lord, we ask you to hear us as we pray from the silence of our hearts. It is for your kingdom that we now pray filled with the Holy Spirit, using the words that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, give us as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time for the offering of our tithes and gifts. Will the deacons please come forward?
Lord, we believe your word and we honor it through giving and using these gifts to further our mission in our church and community. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. We're delighted to see some new faces. We want you to know that if you're worshiping with us for the first time today, we're calling you a first-time worshiper. We want you to feel at home. We want you to feel like this is part of your family. And we want you to understand that we are now approaching the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is open to everyone who desires to partake of it. We, have, we practice what is called an open table. And by that, I mean that everyone who desires to partake is welcome to do so. We do communion two ways here, and the first way is that we have the elders who will pray over the cup and over the bread, and they will come down, and anyone who desires may come forward and take the bread or take in the cup from them and return to their seats. However, because we are in a, still in a time of COVID, if there's anyone who prefers not to have that experience, we do have the self-service ones with the the juice on one side and the bread on the other side, and those are available here. So we would invite you to come forward at the right time to get one, or if you desire uh, to just slip up your hand and one of our deacons will see to it that you have them. But we want you to know that you are all welcome to partake with us. There's no secret handshake, you know, and no, no exchange of anything. It's just you saying, I desire to partake of the Lord's Supper. This table... Our scripture reading for this Sunday is from Acts, Acts 1, 4, 8. On one occasion, while he's eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 2, 40, 47. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. <clears throat> Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. 
grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. How once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first So, Robert, thanks for giving us a present on your birthday, huh? It was very enjoyable and a blessing to us. And uh, just to think, he's not done yet. We're, we have all those hamburgers to look forward to, don't we? I guess I better stop talking about food <laughs> until after the sermon. We better make this a short one, too, right? Oh, yeah, okay. All right. Well, okay. So the passages of Scripture that Elliot Denmark read for us today are Scriptures from the early chapters of the book of Acts, and they have everything to do with the beginnings of the church. The church which began, would you believe, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 years ago. And so as we are continuing through our series, these revised messages about who we are as the Christian church's disciples of Christ, we kind of need to ask ourselves this question, is the church relevant after 2,000 years of history? And so thanks again to Marilyn Bowman for uh, editing my, my messages and giving me some discussion questions. I've uh, included a few of them here. So just to set the table for this discussion. Number one, what attracts people to a church in today's world? And I would add to that slightly that you and I realize that when we say today's world, we're kind of thinking in the last 20 or 30 years, aren't we? Because what attracted people to church 30 or 40 years ago, it's quite different from now, I would think. Second question, is community involvement important? And a third question is, why are we asking people to join our congregation? And a final question is, is the church an institution or is it a movement? Is the church an institution or is it a movement? So our first message a couple of weeks ago was inclusion, and last week's message was unity. I think that these are both very, very biblical, New Testament, and Christian messages, but also very timely when we consider the climate of our world today. You know, words like inclusion and unity are used a lot in conversations, right, in, in public conversations. But it really remains for somebody to demonstrate what inclusion and unity actually looks like. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the other hand, we might say that the word unity and inclusion 
also include the word diversity. But when we talk about unity, people have wildly divergent ideas about what unity is. Is unity where everybody has to all be the same? Or is unity uh, a situation where we can all be united and of the same mind even though we are not all the same? So uh, inclusion and unity and diversity are words that we use all the time, but the question is, can we demonstrate it? Are we practicing it? For some people, the word unity means conformity or uniformity. We'll have unity once everybody becomes like me, right? On the other hand, I believe that for us, unity does not mean uniformity. It means that we are united in Christ, regardless of what our earthly differences are. So we strive for unity within diversity that we embrace. Our differences actually make us stronger if we can learn to understand and appreciate them. So I've always argued that we aspire to be a church relevant to the 21st century because of our unity, our diversity, and because of our practice of inclusion. But as I just hinted at a minute ago, we are living in a different age today than the one that most of us grew up in. It's a very different climate, religiously speaking. When we go back 30 or 40 years into our past, and even more than that, you know, a church building like this one, all you had to do was open the doors on Sunday and people came, right? Things have changed drastically. We now live in a time when people look somewhere else for spiritual fulfillment. And they may drive past this building week after week and say, I wonder what goes on inside there, right? I wonder what, wonder what that building is for. What is a church? But people are looking for spiritual fulfillment. That's not a, something that's going away. But nowadays, they have many more options. And I can't help but believe that one of the reasons for this is because the church in the past century, the 20th century church, now don't anybody get too you know, sensitive here, okay? But I think the church in the 20th century kind of shot itself in the foot. I think that in many ways, the church of the 20th century taught conformity, exclusion, and division. And in an age when we see that all of the major denominations are declining, churches are declining, churches are closing, what makes me think that this congregation is relevant for this day and this age? What strategies or approaches do we need to implement and follow in order to see a church to continue to grow and thrive and minister to this community? So let me give you about four items. I don't usually give out a list, but I have four, four things today. The first one is this. What are we calling people to? Are we calling people to a church? Are we calling people to a denomination? Are we calling people to a particular budget? No. We are calling people to faithfulness to Christ. Our loyalty is to Christ first. Our denomination is called the Christian Church's Disciples of Christ because it is a movement to unite Christians according to a simple reading of the New Testament. But Christ is the head of the church, not a bishop, not a pope, not a president, not, not anything else. Christ is the head of the church. And it reminds me of something Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 8. To them he wrote, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, let that one be accursed." Now that sounds like he's pouring it on kind of heavy, doesn't it? But Paul's point is that the gospel message is not about a denomination. It's not about a budget. It's not about survival. It's not about, you know, meeting a certain numbers game. 
The gospel is a message about Christ. The gospel is a message about salvation in Christ. The churches that Paul was addressing there in Galatians chapter 6, sorry, chapter 1, had believed in Jesus, they accepted the gospel, and they were worshiping Christ, and then another group of people came along and said, wait a minute, you can't be Christians until you do these other things first. And that's why Paul wrote these strong messages. If someone preaches to you another gospel, let them be accursed. He wrote these strong words to emphasize that Christians are brought near to God through their relationship with Christ, not through a religion, not through a denomination, not through a brick-and-mortar building, not through a lot of other things, but through Christ. Paul simply called the Gentiles to believe in Christ, and so do we. We call people to faithfulness to Christ. If you listen to a lot of the communications from denominational leaders today, and I was just talking with uh, Diane Holliday just a few, about 30 minutes or so ago, a lot of the messages that come out of denominations are kind of like doom and gloom. You know, we're not meeting budget. We're having to cut the cut costs here and there. People are going to do things volunteer-wise instead of this, that, and the other. And I believe that many congregations are the same way. They decline, uh, are experiencing decline because of fear that revolves around meeting budget, around paying the bills. And perhaps this earthly concern has distracted them from the mission of the church itself. Some churches stay open because they rent out the building. We don't need to do that. Some churches stay open because they have uh, done other things to raise funds, cut budgets, and so forth. We don't need to do that. It is not wrong to rent out the building. It is not wrong to host other groups to raise income. It's a good use of the facilities. But my view is that evangelism brings people into the church. When we call people to Christ, when we call people to a saving relationship with Christ, they come to the church. If we call people to the church and say, well, we need you here so that you can put money in the offering plate, they might decide that there is a better spiritual outlet somewhere else, if that makes sense. It makes sense, right? Okay, just making sure I was not crazy. And by the way, if evangelism brings more people into, into the church, more people in the church may translate into more money in the offering plate. To me, it just makes sense. To be sure, offering is not the goal. It is a byproduct. And any congregation or denomination that has lost its evangelistic thrust to call people into relationship with Christ may already be too far gone anyway. All denominations are in decline, all of them, but some local congregations are thriving during this time. What do you suppose the difference is? Community? Inclusion? Oh, you guys are good. A plus, A plus. And I would say having a warm, loving, welcoming, inclusive, diverse Community is all a very important part of it, as well as a focus on Christ as the source of our calling. The secret is the focus. It is either economics or evangelism, and I am telling you that evangelism will take care of economics. Economics will not take care of evangelism. That's a good sound bite. I should, I should, I should write that down. We call people to relationship with Jesus Christ. This is life-giving. This is inspiring. And this is what people want to latch on to. A sense of purpose. A sense of meaning. And the more we practice this, the more alive, the more vibrant we will be as a congregation. And to paraphrase uh, a movie line, right? If you invite them, they will come. And I have learned this over and over and over again. Meet your neighbors. Invite them to church. Some of them won't come. Some of them will. Another point to make 
is that as a congregation, we practice what is called congregational polity. Now, that's a word you don't use every day. And if you uh, don't remember it, that's quite all right. But it simply means this. The congregation makes the decisions. You vote. In fact, today at the end of this service, we'll have a, a brief congregational meeting in which you, the congregation, will approve or not approve the people that have agreed to be deacon, deacons and elders and uh, board chairs and so forth. Congregational polity uh, means that everyone has a voice. And I think that's very important. I mentioned earlier that we practice an open table. So the Lord's Supper is not something that you have to be a member of this church to participate in. The Lord's Supper is not something that you have to qualify for. It's just there for anyone who wants to partake of it. We are the same way about baptism. If you have been baptized into Christ, you have been baptized. We don't ask you to be baptized into the First Christian Church of Atlanta. If you come to us from somewhere else and you have been baptized into Christ, there is no other baptism for you because that is it. And the same thing is true with membership. What do we require? I'm going to ask you, and somebody can respond. What do we, we require of people who say they would like to be a member of First Christian Church of Atlanta? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is something we read in the New Testament. And that is the, the test of fellowship and no other. So the first one is we call people to a relationship with Christ, not to a denomination. The second one is that we are focusing our efforts on Christianity as a movement more than Christianity as an institution. Now, I asked the question, I noticed that some of your eyes kind of did that, you know, looking up into the ceiling to access other parts of your brain. When I asked, is the church an institution or a movement? And I think that's a real tricky one. And uh, how many of you are, if you don't mind, how many of you think movement? Okay. How many of you think institution? How many of you think might be both? Yeah, okay. All right. Some of you didn't vote at all. So you have to be last in a hamburger line. Just kidding, just kidding. Uh, yeah, it's a tough one, but I think, it's, I think we could say both. I, that's what I think. Um, what is the difference between a movement and an institution? Well, typically a movement starts with a core of people, sometimes really small, and then it begins to snowball, and it grows and grows and grows. I think if we look at church history, we can see that that's exactly what happened. Uh, Elliot just read those verses in Acts, and it says that on that day, 3,000 uh, were added to the church. I don't think that verse was in there, but 3,000 or more were added to the church in that day. And then, of course, as we read through the book of Acts, we see that they scattered all over the known world at that time, and the gospel went everywhere uh, due to thousands of unnamed missionaries who shared the gospel all over the world. Why do people join a movement and then spread it? It's probably something that happens because they feel like it is meaningful or compelling, that there's some truth that needs to be told to everybody else. Is that what our message is? Is it a truth that needs to be told to other people? Okay. I'm seeing about three people who think who agree with me on that. Okay, all right. Yeah, okay. On the other hand, an institution is established. It has rules and membership, we try to keep ours at a minimum, right? We try to keep ours kind of limited to what we read in the New Testament and so forth. In both cases, there is a sense of being involved, whether it's a movement or a, an institution. But a movement has momentum. In fact, th both words mean kind of the same thing, right? Movement, momentum. But an institution has structure. And so I think the church is both. The church is an institution all over the world. It is established in practically every country, every language. You know, I, I don't know, there may be a language somewhere where, you know, there's not a church, but, but it's established pretty much all over the world. And it has a firm foundation because the head is Christ. It is instituted, shall we say, on the lordship of Jesus Christ. And in uh, Matthew 16, 18, 
right after Peter gave that great confession, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And uh, I think everybody knows that the word Hades here means grave. The old King James Version said a different word, right? The gates of hell. The grave is what is intended. The, the Greek word used there is uh, Hades, and therefore we just bring it forward into English and more modern translations. The grave, in other words, death will not prevail against it. Hell has no, has no power, right? The, the devil has no power to, to harm us. And that, so therefore we need to clarify that it's the gates of Hades. It is the grave that will not prevail against the kingdom of heaven. The church grew and continues to grow as a movement, though. And as a movement, the church has proclaimed the good news of God's love for humanity in Christ throughout the world. It is sought to help the needy and to hold the powerful to account, as it has done many times over the course of history. As a movement, the message of the church has inspired many great people and many great deeds throughout history. But the same could also be said about the church as an institution. The church has been established wherever the gospel has been preached. And the churches have established other things like hospitals and nursing homes and clinics and all kinds of other things to be of service to the community. But what happens to an institution when its mentality becomes institutional? This is the thing that I think we need to guard against. Sometimes when an institution has been established for a long time, people get comfortable with that institutional mentality and sometimes they stagnate. And again, this is what I believe is happening in the American church around this country. Stagnation. Institutionalized mentality. I had a professor, I think, uh, in, in seminary who made the statement that when you think of your church as an institution, your spiritual mentality is institutionalized. And I don't know if that makes any sense to you. But I do think we have to understand that sometimes we get a little comfortable resting on our pious laurels, as the saying goes. And sometimes we have to revive that movement mentality. If we go back to the 20th century World War II was over, and what happened in this country? An industrial boom. A giant economic expansion. And the church was seen as very much an American institution, or shall we say an institution vital to America. But when churches adopted this mentality, and because it was easy to build a church and they will come, to open the doors and they will show up, the mentality became very institutional. And one thing that I observed growing up in the 70s and 80s was how many churches expanded and expanded and expanded, and that expansion meant larger staffs for the, for the church. Now, there's nothing wrong if you have a large congregation, but if the mentality is business, and you think of the pastor as a CEO, and you think of the staff as all professionals, what does that do to the people in the pew. It changes it from church services to church as a service industry. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but it makes a lot of sense to me that the mentality of the church went from, we're all here to be part of this, this, great, this great movement and now it is, well, I don't really care for the preaching at that church or I don't like the music at that church. Or they don't have anything for, you know, this church over here has got fun and games or something. And all of a sudden it's about, you know, McDonald's or Burger King or, or Kmart or Walmart or Target. You know, it, it, it stopped being service of the community. It stopped being about preaching the gospel and it started becoming a service industry where people go where they feel like they get the most bang for their buck. That is why I believe the church of the 21st century is declining. Because, let's, let's be honest, if it comes to services, if it comes to entertainment, 
if it comes to what makes me feel happy at the moment, the church cannot compete with all the other things that are going on out there in the world. And it never should have tried. Thirdly, we are involved in making our community better. As a local congregation in Tucker, Georgia, we want to be seen as value added to our community. Many congregations are invisible to their communities because they are not involved. And a great rule of thumb would be pull up in a local business somewhere, go inside and act like you're from out of town and say, I'm trying to locate First Christian Church of Atlanta. Can you tell me where it is? If they can't tell you where it is, there is a good chance that the church is invisible in the community. It could be that they're just not aware of things. I want us to be so well known and so respected in this community that if this church were to disappear today, everybody outside these walls would say, man, we miss the First Christian Church of Atlanta. Something is missing from our community. To put it differently, what do we add to this community? Think about it that way. Well, for one thing, we are a house of worship and spiritual direction. We're not the only one. There are many churches up and down the street. There are many churches all around. I think there's probably more than 120 churches in the Tucker area. But we are one of them. And we are definitely a place, I believe, where believers can worship and fellowship and lift up one another. For another thing, we sponsor a lot of events that are good for the community. This past Thursday, we had Dealing with Dementia, and we had, uh, I think, nine or 11 people who came and were served by that. And it is a wonderful opportunity to give something to people who, who, that they desperately need. We also sponsor community meetings. We have the Tucker Community Singers. We have so many things that we do here. We have AA that meets in here. We have Compassionate Friends. So we are a service to the community. Imagine uh, the food bank. And we continue to get food donations. And every week, Joe comes on Wednesday, mostly Wednesdays, picks up all that stuff, takes it down to uh, the networks. And then after he leaves, somebody comes by and drops off more. <laughs> it, it happens every time. <laughs> I'm gratified to think that there are people who would miss First Christian of Atlanta, First Christian Church of Atlanta, if we ceased to exist. Fourthly, and I've been really kind of preaching this the whole time, we live in an age of mission. We were not born into an age of mission, most of us, but we definitely now live in an age of mission. As I am fond of saying, I believe the 21st century church has more in common with that first century church than it does with the 20th century church. That sounds like a mouthful, but let's just say that the church that we live in today in the year 2022 is more like the church in the year one than the year 1968 when I was born. Does that help a little bit? In the, ninth, in the 18th century, the 1700s, that is, you had the Great Awakening, you had the Second Great Awakening, you had all these revival movements, including the one that our denomination grew out of. In the 19th century, you had this growth and expansion, and the church was a very vital part of the community. In the 20th century, churches grew and expanded and became like giant corporate businesses, and it became a dominant institution in the United States of America. And this developed into what is sometimes referred to as cultural Christianity. And by cultural Christianity, we mean simply this, that all of us knew somebody 30 or 40 years ago who didn't go to church but still understood what church was about. Today, we may know people who go to church and still don't know what church is about. I mean, it's just a really different world. That is cultural Christianity. If we can describe the milieu of the first century church as pre-Christian, 
when the church began. Maybe we can describe ours today as almost post-Christian. But I hope that's not going to be the case. I hope that what we're going to see this as is a new era of revival. Would you believe somebody called me this week and asked me, are you guys having a revival meeting anytime soon? And I said, I wish. I wish. Our two passages today speak to this hope. Acts 1, verses 4 through 8, particularly verse 8, says the following, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is the Great Commission. That is, you will be empowered to do the job that I've given you. So if we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, if the church is empowered by the Holy Spirit, should they be in decline? That may be a little bit of a stringent question, but I think it's at least worth considering. The church is empowered by the Holy Spirit and tasked with spreading the gospel. And let us not overlook the symbolism of that sequence. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. It's kind of like saying Tucker, DeKalb County, Georgia, United States, and world. The scope expands and extends beyond the local community because the church and the world are both global. To be devoted to something is to serve it rather than to be served. The local congregation exists to represent Christ on the local level itself and to preach the gospel to the people who live in the vicinity. That's why we're here. That's why we exist. There are other religions, there are alternate forms of spirituality, but there's really, in my mind, nothing quite like a congregation that is on point, that is on mission. There is a family atmosphere, there is a sense of support, there is a sense of love, and there is a sense of meaning that you can't get in other aspects of life. If the 21st century, the one we're living in now, is an age of missions for the church, then let me argue that getting back to the mission is the right way for us to be relevant for the 21st century. Um, James, would you put up that slide that you just had there for a second, the one about the membership? Yes, would you put that up, please? Just let me repeat this and we'll close. What does it mean to join the church? The church is the body of Christ, and it refers to all believers in all places and at all times who follow Jesus. If you are a believer, I believe that you already belong to the church. We invite you, however, to join our local congregation. We are not the only church in town, but we are a congregation that makes a difference. We invite you to be a part of what we are doing to serve God and our community at this location. Membership is not required to belong, but it is essential for those who take a leadership role, which, of course, we'll be talking about very shortly. And on that note, I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn. What a good way to end this with, I am thine, O Lord.
right before I turn this over to Jim Holiday, let me say that if you are uh, worshiping with us for the first time, we are going to have a brief congregational meeting, after which we are going to go out and eat hamburgers. And so we invite you to stay and have lunch with us today. If you do want to skip out of the meeting, we certainly invite you to step out into the narthex or out to the hamburger truck. We do encourage all of our members to stay and uh, to listen very quickly and then to vote. And before we do that, let me just offer a word of benediction. This is from, uh, the, this is a Franciscan benediction. May God bless you with discomfort. At easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Turn it over to Jim. Hi. While we're getting settled, we're going to have what is called a congregational meeting.